Hello, and thank you for joining us for our for today's webcast. Before we begin, we're going to do just a quick audio test. I'm going to ask the early attendees to use the chat box and send a message to host if you have any problems hearing our presenters speak. Gary, would you please introduce yourself? Yes, hello. This is Gary Oishi, and I'm with uh, Millipore Sigma. Thank you. And Ed? Hi, this is Ed Rakowski with AIHA. Great. I can hear both of you well. I'm going to monitor the chat box for any issues our attendees might be having, and we'll begin in just a few moments. Please take a moment to look at the chat area in the lower right corner of your screen. If your chat module is not open, you can go ahead and select chat. It's located at the very bottom center of your screen. And in the chat module, you'll see a drop-down menu with options next to the word to. If you have any technical problems today, please send a private chat message to host. If you have questions for the presenter, please send those to all panelists. And if you have questions or comments you just want to share with the entire audience, send a chat to all participants. A recording will be available later today at aiha.webvent.tv, and we will send all registrants an email tomorrow with this link. And now I'll turn the microphone over to Ed. Thanks, Regina, and welcome everyone to today's webinar, What You Need to Know About the Sample Collection and Analysis of Carbonyls, i.e. formaldehyde, in hair. I'm Ed Rakowski, Editor-in-Chief of The Synergist, the magazine of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. I'd like to thank all listeners for attending today's event, and especially Millipore Sigma for sponsoring this webinar. Our presenter today, Gary Oishi, is an R&D chemist in the air monitoring group at Millipore Sigma. Gary is involved with helping develop new products and testing methodologies in air monitoring. He previously spent over 20 years in analytical chemistry involved with the identification of micro and macro contaminations in failure analysis, deformulation, forensic, and industrial hygiene sample testing. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Gary. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this presentation. Um, let me get this screen up here. And here we go. Um, Again, I want to thank uh, Ed and Regina um, for hosting this or inviting me to present this to you. Um, we're going to be talking about um, sampling back to basics as it applies to formaldehyde, but essentially carbonyls in the air. Topics that will be covered are the customary review of what our analyte is or analytes are. Why are we concerned? Why do we sample for, followed by how do we accomplish this task? Gary, it's Regina. Yes. Can you sh share yep. your screen for us? Ooh, did I not do that? Okay. No, not yet. Just go ahead and share my screen, and we'll be able to see. We'll be, we'll be with right, you. Wait a there we go. Share my screen. There you go. Fantastic. There we go. Thank you. Okay. So let me get rid of this. Okay, how's that? That is great, um, thank you. Okay, okay, back at it. Um, again, this uh, we're going to be covering basically what our analyte is or analytes are, why we are concerned, why do we sample for, followed by how do we accomplish this task. Um, you'll see I have two bullet points highlighted in purple at the bottom. If 
those are kind of more pertaining to people who are more interested in kind of like looking at or understanding the whole workflow of what happens to samples after you've taken them. So what is, a, what is formaldehyde? Um, it's a simple organic carbonyl compound with hydrogen attached as the R groups. Ketones are carbonyls also, and similar in structure, lending the sampling and analysis for both classes of compounds to be interchangeable. Uh, formaldehyde exists as a color pungent gas with vapor density similar to that of air. So why are we concerned? Short-term exposure affects the eyes and respiratory system, presented as irritation, sensitization, and acute lung damage. Long-term exposure, according to information from the CDC, can lead to nose and throat cancer, with exposure level and duration affecting your chance of getting cancer. Why do we sample for carbonyls? As an example is the SDS for formalin containing formaldehyde and methanol. Companies who work with this product or similar products that contain formaldehyde must communicate the hazard to their employees and provide necessary engineering controls and personal protective equipment to ensure a safe working environment. The SDS provides a wealth of chemical hazard information, including GHS labeling requirements in Section 2, but also exposure limits, Section 8, and so on. What is not listed are the analytical methods for OSHA and or NIOSH. It is up to you, the industrial hygienist, to take this information and perform monitoring or risk assessment for regulatory compliance where necessary. Where else can formaldehyde be found um, outside of the workplace? Uh, everyday life sources can be from furniture made from manufactured wood, like desks, bookshelves, kitchen cabinets, and construction materials, glues, personal care and household products, and in paints. The NIH has a, actually a database of household products that contain formaldehyde. This leads into how do we sample for and will start the bulk of my webinar. This chart shows various exposure levels for these analytes and the possible associated methods corresponding to them. What is the scope of the task? So these are questions that we really need to uh, consider. The easiest situation will be when this is for established routine or historical monitoring to the challenging when this is something new, leading to what do I do? The next question is, there already a method? If the answer is yes, it's nice to be lucky sometimes, but don't rush out and buy that lotto ticket just yet, as the answer could just be the tip of an iceberg. In our case, sampling for formaldehyde, there are multiple methods. To give you a better chance at making the appropriate decision, let's look at what really is involved with sampling. At this point, you think you're finished. Well, um, well let's start, first we'll look at active sampling world. For the most part, it, I might be correct in saying that this has been around since the beginning of industrial hygiene, and given your age and experience in the field, you would be familiar with using an air sampling pump. If this is new, then welcome to active sampling. We have seen in, pre in a previous slide that there are a number of methods we could choose from, divided into several groups based on the analytical finish. Active sampling using a sampling media of DMPH coated material has been the industry standard. For those of you who have experienced sampling using impingers, oh, happy days for the advent of solid sorbents. Two, another alternative is using two HMP coated on a porous polymer. And I'll touch on this in, later on in the presentation. Um, now that you kind of have seen that we've, uh, there are, and looking at the slide, there are multiple choices in various formats. Uh, now your choice will be dependent upon a couple of possible questions given your situation. Who is going to analyze the samples? What are they used to? And what are they capable of? If you're just starting, it will be, what am I comfortable with? 
So we have uh, syringe style uh, samplers and glass uh, body samplers, or we commonly call or refer to as Orbo. In this slide, we look closer at what could influence our decision. Syringe barrel type samplers are quick and easy device style for the laboratory to perform sampling preparation and analysis. If not using a completely automated system, sample preparation can be more labor intensive, have higher cost, and a slower turnaround. Sometimes it's not just about taking a sample, but in the processing of those samples as well. What about sampling in high concentration environments? In a situation where there is known likelihood of sampling in high concentration cases, larger formats do exist. Here are some examples. These devices are choices when your previous sample was overloaded, when you know there was a release of formaldehyde in the environment, or if you have an unknown, basically when larger capacity is needed. I hope I'm not going too fast for everybody. Sometime, some, well, something else to consider when sampling is the interference from ozone. Um, not a very common or very uh, well-known case. But ozone reacts with the carbonyl hydrozone derivative and can result in a significant negative interference for formaldehyde and other carbonyls when using a DMPH sampling device. This is an important consideration when sampling outdoors in urban environments with high ozone concentrations, and also when sampling indoors in such environments due to air infiltration, even with the presence of printers or photocopiers. An ozone scrubber can be used upstream of the sampling device to remove ozone from the sampling train before it ever gets there. Ozone scrubbers may contain granular potassium iodine salt or BPE coated silica gel. When air containing ozone is drawn through either ozone scrubber type, the ozone is reduced, thus removing the interference. An alternative for those who want it all could be using this format. This cartridge incorporates an additional layer of BPE, which is 1,2-bis-4 pyridyl ethylene in one tube. With this additional material, ozone interference is eliminated, again, with the added benefit of now the ozone can be quantitated if so needed. And you'll have to check with um, the lab that you that does perform your analysis to see whether or not they have this, that capability. How else can a sample be taken? Another pathway is passive sampling. Advantages would be they are, for the most part, smaller, lighter weight, and do not require complex training needed for sample collection. They do not require the use of a pump, making the process less expensive and quicker to deploy. Remember how you hated using impingers for sampling and somehow some of the sampling solution got mysteriously sucked into that expensive pump after specific instructions were given not to bend over? Well, this is kind of like the next step towards easy. Not only can passive be used for personal but area sampling as well. Long sampling times are possible with not having to be dependent upon a battery or having to be close to an outlet. And I know it sounds great so far, but don't sign on the dotted line quite yet, as there are some limitations as given in OSHA method 1007 regarding ozone and humidity requirements. Also, sampling rates can't be modified, as these are based upon the specific sampler used. One last thing to be aware of is for those applications kind of outside the box um, is that there needs to be a determined sampling rate for a compound of interest for this to be useful. To get better understanding of just what is passive sampling, let's look at the basic theory involved. Passive or diffusive sampling is based upon fixed law 
that states that the rate of diffusion is equal to the diffusion coefficient times the diffusion surface times the concentration gradient. And with some math, and I know everybody enjoys math, integrating the equation and simplifying with respect to sampling rate, we now see that the sampling rate is equal to the diffusion coefficient, which is a constant times the ratio of the diffusive surface over the diffusive path length. All this will become more important when we look at sampler design next. Two sampler design choices are available, uh, the traditional flat and the radial. I know just what you need, another choice. Remember how we looked at sampling rate? Differences do become apparent. Radial design does improve sensitivity because for a given sampling time period, more air is being passively sampled. The sampling rate and the sampling capacity are also larger because of the geometric design differences. For a comparative view of the two types, there are two charts uh, with data published by OSHA and from uh, sampler manufacturers. As expected, we do see the difference as I mentioned earlier. Does that make one better than the other? At first you might think radial is, however, I would have to caution you that it would truly rely on your sampling situation. But for now, I will talk more about radial samplers and that reason will become more apparent as we continue. To recap on some of the earlier information, we can see that a radial design can produce higher sampling rates than axial. The graph on the right shows the sampling rate for formaldehyde as determined by direct comparison to active sampling. Are you kind of seeing why I'm talking about radial design samplers now? One of the two radial design samplers is comprised of a porous polyethylene tube, which is a diffusive body, acts, um, to which attached a small, is attached a small polypropylene syringe used for elution of analytes from the adsorbent. Silica gel coated with 2,4-dinitrophenylhydrazine, DMPH, acts as the adsorbent and moves from the diffusive end during the sampling collection to the syringe end for sample extraction by inverting the device, so essentially flipping it over. As our example, formaldehyde, or really any carbonyl compound, reacts in the same diversification mechanism as, an as a traditional active sampler. The second radial design sampler is called Radiello. This is similar to the sampler you just had seen in that it also relies on the traditional DMPH diversification mechanism. If you look at the last bullet point showing the sampling rate of 99 mils per minute and compare that to OSHA 2016 active sampling rate range of 30 to 1500 mils per minute makes you kind of think of some possibilities. I know some of you are asking why is there a difference in sampling rate between the two rate designs you've just seen. The answer is that Sampling rate is related to geometric design dimensions. So as I mentioned earlier, there's also an alternative for sampling carbonyls. Um, I wanted to make sure that this information didn't get left out as one more possible choice. And what's one more, pos what's one more choice at this point? Air samples can be collected by drawing known volumes of air through sampling tubes with containing XAD2 adsorbent coated with 2-hydroxymethylpyridine, or commonly called 2-HMP. The diversization product is then extracted and analyzed by gas chromatography using a nitrogen-specific detector. The advantage of this choice is primarily the sample stability at room temperature. Do I choose this one? Ask yourself, does this satisfy all my sampling and laboratory requirements? Now let's kind of shift gears and move into getting set up for active sampling. 
For most of you, this may be routine, but there are more choices ahead. As you have seen, the many types, styles of sampling media, each one has a different configuration. Just like in life, we all have more than one pair of shoes, and so we need different socks to match. Thus, in sampling world, fittings, different fittings will be needed. Unfortunately, there is not just one. How do you connect the active sampling media to a pump? In this diagram, there are parts that I've labeled needed for sampling using a glass sampling tube. The important part in this setup is the tube holder, as it provides flow rate control if needed and protection for the person wearing the sampler from the opened end of the glass tube. Typically, no special fittings are needed unless the tubing used is a different size. You will see in the next two slides now each format, how each format will be different. Now here, some fittings will definitely be needed for setting up a syringe style sampling tube. This is due to the orientation when sampling. At first, first glance for the person sampling, it would appear that it would be easier to have the tube tip used to connect to the tubing. However, logic behind the orientation as seen in this diagram is that air containing carbonyls or formaldehyde start to get collected at the tip end. When the lab processes your sample, they will elute any derivatized material through the shortest path length as possible, which makes this elution process giving it the smallest or since they're using a fixed volume of solvent and makes the solvent wash, in, you know, makes it easier to collect into a volumetric. Um, so it's not just about pulling the sample, it's also about processing. In the last configuration, uh, use of Resorian or reversible style sampling formats can easily be connected in series if needed. As seen from the last several slides with the right type of fitting setup, your sampling train doesn't seem you know, such a daunting task. I found what makes the whole process go smoothly is to first choose one size of tubing for all future work. And then the several fittings needed for the different media formats will easily become apparent Now that we've finally configured our sampling train, the last step is calibration. I'm going to briefly kind of delve into this subject. However, this does not mean that calibration is unimportant, as it is certainly. But to do this topic justice would best be addressed separately on its own. Calibration is required for all active sampling. For those people who have chosen the passive sampling route, Congratulations, feel free to take a quick nap. However, you are still welcome to listen and see what you're missing out on. How is this done? You will need a calibration device, and that device can be either a primary or secondary standard connected to your sampling train. Why is calibration important? Flow rate needs to be determined as accurately as possible in order to determine the actual air volume sampled, as this is important in the for use in the final calculation in yielding exposure concentration. For example, as a scientist, it wouldn't exude a lot of confidence making a statement to an astronaut such as saying, well, we will about get you to the moon. So accuracy is important. So your sampling train setup is completed by connecting your pump to your sampling media using tubing and the necessary fittings. Um, uh, the next step would be to set the pump to your desired flow rate. And I would recommend before connecting your sampling media to the pump um, is to set the flow rate on the pump and run it unconnected for at least five minutes to allow the pump to warm up. This kind of helps in reducing the possible flow rate fluctuations that, could, that might occur. Um, next, connect the calibrator to the sampling train and start the pump at the selected flow rate. 
take at least five flow rate measurements, and the average will be your calibrated flow rate. With the average flow rate, uh, determine, adjust the flow rate on the pump to match if it has that capability. Otherwise, record the average flow rate and to be used for later calculation um, using the, the, your sampling time function. Next, you basically disconnect the calibrator from the sam sampling train. And now you're almost ready to start taking a sample. So now the workflow for calibration is complete. Only a couple of details need to be addressed. Depending upon the sampling pump you're using, you will need to record start and stop time, temperature, barometric pressure, start and stop flow rates, and sampler identification. Congratulations, you're now ready to take a sample. And once that has been completed, your samples are ready to be sent to the lab for analysis. Remember to check the shipping requirements for the specific sampler used. DMPH samplers used for formaldehyde need to be shipped on ice. If you are performing the sampling, you are finished for now until the lab results are returned. If those of you who are responsible for both sampling and analysis, you're halfway home. And I'm impressed with the amount of knowledge and expertise you have in performing both. If you're just looking and relying on an accredited lab for sample analysis, here is a look into what happens to your sample. Sample preparation varies slightly depending upon the format of the sampler. For glass sampling tubes, the media first needs to be removed by breaking open the tube and pouring the contents out into vials, and then follow the sample prep steps given in the method for solvent desorption for solvent desorption selection, volume, and extraction times. Sample preparation details for syringe style format can also be found in, in the chosen method. Typically, this will involve using successive elutions with method desorption solvent collected into a volumetric, transfer a portion of the volumetric into a vial for analysis. Resorian and reversible style formats need a reservoir to be attached to hold the volume of solvent during the elution step, just like with the syringe body format collection into a volumetric and proportioning of the final collected volume into a vial for analysis also done. Sample prep is now, now it's time for the instrument portion of the analysis. So why HPLC? To understand the logic of this approach, it starts with the nature of the analyte. Due to formaldehyde's physical and chemical properties, collection and retention make it a challenge to improve the collection and retention. Derivatization using DMPH enables the creation of a reaction product that is more stable and provides a path for detection. In addition, the derivatization reaction creates specific compounds based upon the carbonyl giving speciation. For those of you who are familiar with the old Impinger method 3500 for formaldehyde, there was no speciation. So any carbonyl present other than the formaldehyde that you were looking for had a positive interference. Here's an example of an instrument parameters that could be used. This would allow us now to detect and separate the individual carbonyl species from each other. Here's an example of an HPLC chromatogram for formaldehyde, as you can't have an analytical section without having at least one of these. Given the previous instrument parameters, the formaldehyde samples can now be analyzed and quantitated. We did touch or also on the use of an alter alternative media other than DMPH to HMP as a different analytical finish using gas chromatography. This is an example of such. So now the samples have been analyzed and the mass quantity of formaldehyde can then be reported back to whomever took those samples. The final step 
is then calculation of the concentration in air using the mass quantity reported by the lab and the air volume you collected. To summarize what we covered, there are a lot of choices to be made from making a decision on if and what method, which sampler format makes sense, what connections need to be made, flow rate accuracy, and we also saw a brief insight into what happens after sample collection. Hopefully you will have more information to make choices that yield to smart sampling for whatever your situation is. And I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules for some back to basics. And if you have any questions, feel free to chat. Okay, thanks, Gary. Um, I have quite a bit of time yeah. left uh, for, for some questions. Um, while we're waiting for participants to send those to us through the chat module, uh, Gary, I, that was a lot of information you got through. I was wondering if there's anything uh, uh, in the slide that you wanted to uh, linger on a little bit longer or um, to provide a little bit more information on? Well, lo a lot of it is, and hopefully, you know, there, there, I know there was a lot of information there. Um, everyone should be, I guess, getting a PDF of uh, the presentation. So, you know, they'll have, you know, you can have take more time in actually looking at some of that information. But all, all the whole purpose of what I wanted to do or accomplish was to give everybody some idea of what's available out there and why the, you know, and having so many methods. Again, which one do you choose? And um, but again, it's all and e everyone has a different situation, a different case. Um, so not everyone's going to be using the same format or the same style of sampler. Every and not all labs will be able to do um, the analytical part uh, for all the samplers. So again, just to show you that there are a lot of possibilities out there. As any anything in the in life, there are a lot of choices. Okay, thanks, uh, Gary. We are having some questions roll in now. Uh, here's one from Joseph. Uh, he asks, how about specific concerns with shipment shipment of samples to the laboratory? Um, the only concern would be, or like, I mean, for DMPH samplers, um, you. Like I said earlier, you definitely want to ship them on ice. Um, you want them cold. The only concern would be is if it's if you're in a warmer climate or if it's during the summer. Um, I would contact a lab that who is doing the work and make sure that they have some something that's set up for um, getting those samples in a in an expedient way. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions about uh, the ozone interference. Um, and Nick asked, mm -hmm. at what ozone level should I be concerned with in regards to scrubbing? Um, ozone has, does definitely has an impact on a negative impact. Typically, if you do not scrub um, at high enough levels, you would probably see it could be up to on average, it could be a, like a 10% lower um, result. Um, I would say it, it, it's really up to the person or the environment that you're sampling in. I know for some reason, back in my mind, around, I want to say 50 part per million, that may be but I would have to check on that, and I could get back to you on that. Okay. Um, a question from Dale. He asked, what are the interlab and intralab COVs for the HPLC method? Um, each, there are, I would say, those are going to be dictated by the method that's chosen, whether it's NIOSH uh, 2016. I mean, a lot of those have requirements for um, 
TLVs and also for um, precision and accuracy. So, um, so most, so all the processing or all the, the labs performing the analysis will have to meet those requirements. And again, if they're if they are accredited, they will ha have gone through um, performance testing. Okay, thanks. Uh, here's a question from Elizabeth: uh, Do the tubes for formaldehyde sampling have to be kept frozen prior to sampling, or only after sample collection? If it has, the tubes, I mean, I, I, I'm guessing everybody's referring to DMPH, but the tubes do definitely need to be kept cold um, before sampling. I mean, they don't need to be frozen as long as they're refrigerated. Um, before use, I would let them come to room temperature. Okay. Uh, Janet asks, uh, do you have thoughts or recommendations on doing an aldehyde scan where you don't know for sure which aldehydes may be present? Um, if, if you know that it's an aldehyde, um, certainly DMPH would be a great tool to use um, since it does give you the speciation. Again, but you would, you're going to have, if you don't, even if you don't know the level, um, you can try take, a, I mean, what a lot of times what I end up doing in this kind of situation is I will run two samplers or basically two samplers at the same time, uh, one at a higher flow rate than the other. Um, if, I need, if I need that accuracy uh, as far as um, for getting a concentration, but if you're just looking for what's kind of present, that may also help. Larger sample volume collected will give you more sensitivity. Um, but if you, if it is as an unknown, and you, it is as an unknown concentration, um, at least you can see and have to do it only once, even though you may over, be over capacity on one to it at the larger volume. Um, you, you'll have a, a sample at, the, at a lower volume, which would uh, give you that the result, the quantitative result that you're going to need if it comes back to that. Otherwise, you're going to have to go back and resample. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of sampling strategy as far as, you know, do you have to go back? Going once is great. Having to go back twice is uh, kind of an inconvenience, but, you know, having to then tailor, depending on what the data shows, to go back again. So the more you have to go back, the more work it actually becomes. Okay, there's a question from John. Uh, could you cover effects of humidity on passive sampling again? Sure. Um, well, humidity, what ends up happening with humidity, uh, there's a requirement for humidity for using DMPH. Obviously, DMPH is a uh, dirtization reagent that's coated on a sorbent, a, a solid sorbent. So the way the reaction works is that any carbonyls or uh, react on or when it when it comes in contact with that dirtization reagent. Now humidity has to be at a certain level. You can't run or it you start to lose the effect of the sampling at very low humidity because in order for DMPH to actually create a surface, um, a reactive surface or a surface where you get mass transfer, uh, it needs, you need to have some moisture present because DMPH is actually a solid. Uh, so having humidity is actually good Having too much humidity greater than, I'd say, probably about 80, maybe 85, around that ballpark plus, you start to run into some situations where the moisture is just kind of inhibiting that mass transfer. Okay, Martin asks, uh, could you give an example or two of when you might use one method versus another? Um, 
say for example, okay, well, one example yeah, I gave like uh, as the alternative um, sampler uh, using 2HMP. Um, one of the advantages of that is it, 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 the, after you take the sampler, take the sample, your samples are going to be stable at room temperature. So in the case if you cannot get or are not able to ship your samples and keep or keep them cold and getting them to the lab, then maybe using that style format would make sense. Um, if you're using, if that's not the case and the lab is close by or you're, you know, or it's maybe fall outside, you know, fall season or winter or wherever and the, the temperatures don't get extremely high, then using a standard uh, DMPH uh, syringe body would, would, would make good sense. And if you, you know, we have the resorient or reversible style, I mean, connections, the fitting connections on these, if you're worried about fitting connections, the uh, resorient um, has, they have basically lure lock styles on those, so they twist together. So making it so if there's going to be a lot of jostling around or, or uh, the sampler is going to be or could be impacted by just a physical impact, um, then making a better connection might make sense. So, you know, again, depending on the situation where you're sampling, and I know for a lot of people who sample in different, um, have different cases where they're going out to sample for, you know, consultants or, or you know, they're always going to be in different situations where they're, you know, the people they're sampling on, you know, uh, so having that said, you know, that's why there are a lot of different kind of formats to choose from, and that would kind of dictate which one makes the most sense. Okay, uh, Carla asks, how does ozone interfere with the results? Well, ozone, what ozone does is it actually kind of chews up the, uh, deriv the your derivatized material. So what you need to be more, you know, kind of aware of there is that um, it's, it's, it's not like uh, you're in a, an area where, or if you are in an area where there's high ozone, then, you, you know, it, it's basically kind of take, you're, you're pulling that ozone, it's coming through in the air sample that you're, you're collecting, and as you're carbonyl or formaldehyde is getting reacted on the surface, what that ozone does is that actually takes that derivative and degrades it to a product where it's not, doesn't show up in the analytical part as as a derivatized reagent, or the, excuse me, as a derivatized product. So as the quantitation goes, you, you're not going to see that present you're going it's going to come out some it may come out somewhere else in the chromatogram so that's a little you know a kind of a good and bad part about why speciation is necessary and why you know having the precautions to make sure that those created species still are and remain there for you to be analyzed okay uh, Donald asks do you have any research-based information to help with the decision on active versus passive sampling? Well, you know, I talked to a lot of people about active versus passive sampling. And, it, you know, again, it's one of those things where active sampling is kind of like the, was came around first. Um, and for, you know, not to give away how old I am, but you know, it's, I remember that the only way to sample was active sampling, um, and using impingers. So that kind of gives you some idea. Uh, but for you know, I've talked to a lot newer or younger people coming into the business or into the industry, and are learning about what's being available. And when they see passive sampler, it's like for them, you know, um, it's like kind of like the idea of having a cell phone. You, you have 
you have the technology. It's something new. It's something easy versus, you know, we before we would never had or carried around a phone. And when you did at that first advent, it was basically like a suitcase. So, you know, there's that progression in technology and whether or not, you know, if it works for you in your case, then, you know, and it's, you know, a matter of a lot of other factors, whether, you know, it, you have the, you know, you, it's not as expensive as using active sampling because you don't need to buy a pump. But there are, as I said in this presentation, there are caveats to active, to passive sampling where if your compound or if, the, if there was a compound that you were interested in and wanted to use passive and there was no data as far as um, sampling rate for that passive sampler, then you can certainly, you, you might think about, well, I could use um, some theoretical uh, sampling or diffusion, diffusion rates in order to calculate that uh, sampling rate. But then again, it, it's, you're basing this off of uh, theory, but not as a practical application and getting an accurate number. So you're just going to be, it's just going to be an approximation at that point. So why really even bother taking that sample? Uh, Stephen asks, um, can you uh, talk about the, any precautions to take during sampling where employees may encounter other carbonyl sources, such as cigarette smoke during breaks? <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, you know, that, and I, and I can definitely see how that could happen. Um, I think the, the Again, it's one of those precautions where, you know, maybe it's, a, it's just a matter of protocol, whether or not sampling needs to be performed at that point in time. Um, I know some, you know, I, I would venture to guess um, if this is going to be, and it would probably be easier, well, I mean, I, either way easier if it's going to be active or, or passive. Passive, you could just basically, um, they could just take the, the sampling badge off at that point and go on their break, but then again, that passive sampler is still sampling. Um, but for an active sampler, there are ways, you know, if they're going to go on a break, you can turn the pump off, um, stop the sample, and then restart it when they come back to the job. Otherwise, I don't know if that would be considered as, or would be considered in a eight hour work shift sampling meet that criteria? But good question. <laughs> yeah, here's a question from Peter John. Uh, he asks, would you recommend a calibration jar for calibration? A calibration jar um, only for samplers that are large, and you can't hook a calibrator to it. But most calibrators, and again, with the right fittings, you can hook essentially almost every calibrator every sampling media or active sampling media to a calibrator. Um, the only time and the only sampling that I know of where you would need a calibration jar would be if you're using, and it wouldn't be for doing um, sampling for formaldehyde or, or carbonyls. It's based, I don't, if you're familiar with, say, like a puff style cartridge where it has a, a lot larger format, um, it's almost impossible to hook a piece of tubing to one of these glass uh, puff cartridges. Um, they're used for doing uh, pesticides and PAHs. Um, but that's a whole different topic. But yeah, uh, not in this case. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't need to use a sampling jar. Okay, uh, Susanna asked, uh, since there are so many choices, is there any flow chart or table to guide selection among the different choices? For example, uh, something that would help uh, a decision regarding different scenarios, concentrations, and environmental concerns. Um, unfortunately, I have never seen one. I have not created one. I'm, I'm with your question. I just may have to. to Make one for, uh, but uh, that would be that would be great to have. Uh, 
there's so many different little branches that I could see coming off of, you know, one question and some questions that you need to go down would have maybe as much impact or could have less impact on the direction you, you know, that you go. Um, but again, yeah, that's, that's a, that would be great to have. Uh, Boyd asked, you mentioned syringe, uh, syringe sampling method. Is that method used for grab or QA sampling, or is it also used for TWA sampling? Um, not really used for, it, it's not a, a, well, I guess you could use it as a, for a grab sample, but typically grab samples are very, you know, they're short or small volume. Um, more, these are going to be more for, you can do STEL or definitely TWA uh, sampling. Uh, you can, the only problem is, and this is where you get into some of the uh, limitations, or, or I would say, based on kind of like the chemistry or the physics of of a sampler, is that small or short, low volume samples, you want to be able to collect them on a very small amount of material. So, for example, instead of like a syringe body, you could use maybe a glass sampling tube filled with uh, DMPH. Now that would have a smaller volume or smaller amount of uh, collection media, sampling media, and to collect your analyte onto that media is one thing, but to get it off and to be able to see it analytically is the other challenge. If you have a low amount of material collected, the best way to increase sensitivity or to have enough sensitivity to see it is to use the smallest volume to extract it with. So there you start, now you have to start looking at the extraction efficiency of, the diff of that media and how well you, how much volume can you go down to minimum in order to get the sensitivity in order to see anything. So um, there are definitely things that you need to kind of take into consideration. Um, I know there are uh, colorimetric indicator tubes that people have used for doing like quick grab samples. That's, those are great um, for doing screening. Um, I would not rely on them for doing any, quanti based on any quantitative work, um, but uh, you know, that's where making sure that you can collect, if you collect enough material, and just kind of like the math behind it, if you collect enough material and have enough volume that you've collected, then that number is large enough where you have more reliability in that number than a very small number. Okay, uh, Carla asks, can mini cams be used for formaldehyde sampling? Mini cans, such as, like, I guess, I'm taking like canisters. Then, um, canisters can you can use canisters. Um, I I don't have a whole lot of experience with canisters, but I always have this feeling that canisters, you can you can sample with them. You know, obviously you can set up, since they're eva evacuated, you can pull a certain flow rate. Um, you can use that as a, as a, like, I mean, if you want, instead of collecting it as a grab sample inside the canister, you can actually use that as your sampling pump. I can see you can definitely drive a flow rate, um, but collecting inside formaldehyde, yeah, you know, typically you want to derivatize formaldehyde because it is reactive. I mean, I don't know the, the kinetics as far as how stable it is for how long in, in an environment like that. But um, again, it, you're going to have to do it. They're going to, the, the, after collecting in a canister, that's going to have to then be analyzed in some fashion. 
And in order to analyze that, whether that's going to go into a, directly into a GC or if that's going to be trapped on a material, if that's trapped on a material and absorbed, because that way you get a concentration effect, it's going to be done either, say, for example, on DMPH. So it's like, well, you know, you're kind of skipping it. You're kind of throwing an extra step in there when you really don't need to. Okay. Uh, Jeff asks, do you have an opinion about or information on various real-time formaldehyde detectors? I do not. I've looked at a few of them. Um, I like, and this again, this is it could probably be, you know, I, that's going to be the next or the next evolution in this whole technology bit. Um, I'm kind of a fan of, and I love the, the whole concept of real-time analysis. Um, I think that's eventually the way everything is going to go, especially if you're like that, you know, uh, you know, sci-fi or Star Trek kind of uh, person. Uh, I, you know, I, I, and I, I'm kind of, it's, I think it's going to kind of be unfortunate by the, you know, in my lifetime, I probably won't be able to see that, but I hope, you know, people in the future that does occur. Uh, I think right now it's a matter of sensitivity, being able to see down to certain levels um, without any interferences, and that would be the key part. Okay, well, we've reached the end of the questions, Gary. Thanks so much for your presentation today. You did a great job. Um, uh, I did want to tell uh, somebody had a question about um, that a coworker wasn't able to log in earlier and was asking if uh, the, uh, that person would be able to access the presentation, and that is true. Uh, he will. Um, uh, an email with a, a link to the uh, recorded version of this presentation will be sent out tomorrow. Um, and uh, a, uh, uh, just to answer another question that came in, uh, AIHA will uh, track and update uh, all uh, attendees' educational transcripts um, uh, over the next couple of weeks, and you'll receive an email when that process is done, as long as you have an account with AIHA.org. If you have any questions about that, please contact us at synergist at AIHA.org. And with that, I guess we'll conclude today's webinar. Um, my thanks to Gary Oishi for his presentation, to Millipore Sigma for sponsoring today's webinar, and to all of our partic participants. Uh, our next Synergist webinar, Can You See Me, ANSI, and FR, will be held on November 28th. You can register to attend that free webinar at AIHA.webvent.tv. All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending today. This actually concludes today's webcast. The recording will be available at aiha.webvent.tv. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with this link. And please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts.
and every and it's not like one thing works for everyone. If it was just one product, this is all the Hey, use this. 